Electrical current is the flow of electric charge, such as when electrons flow through a wire or when ions flow through a solution. Redox reactions involve transfer of electrons from one substance to another, so these types of reactions have the potential to generate electrical current. Consider the spontaneous redox reaction in which zinc metal reacts with aqueous copper two ions to produce aqueous zinc two plus ions and copper metal. If we were to put a piece of zinc metal into a solution of copper ions, the greater tendency of zinc to lose electrons results in the zinc being oxidized and the copper ions being reduced. In this case, electrons are transferred directly from the zinc metal to the copper ions. However, we could separate the zinc atoms and the copper ions and force the electrons to be transferred through some other means. In this case, the electrons could be transferred through a wire that connects to two different solutions. In one solution, we have copper metal in a solution of copper ions, and in the other cell, we would have zinc metal in a solution of zinc ions. The flowing electrons would constitute an electrical current and could therefore be used to do electrical work. When we have a setup such as we just described, we can call this a voltaic cell. The generation of electricity through redox reactions is called an electrochemical cell. A voltaic, or sometimes called a galvanic cell, is an electrochemical cell that produces electrical current because it has a spontaneous chemical reaction. A second type of electrochemical cell, called an electrolytic cell, consumes electrical current to force a non-spontaneous chemical reaction to take place. We'll discuss electrolytic cells in a later video. If we think about this voltaic cell involving zinc metal and zinc ions in one half cell and copper metal and copper ions in the second half cell, we can begin to think about why a spontaneous reaction is going to take place. The zinc metal will reach equilibrium with the zinc ions in solution. At the same time, the copper metal will reach equilibrium with the copper ions in its half cell. The zinc metal has a greater tendency to lose electrons than does the copper metal. As a result, the zinc strip in its half cell will end up with a slightly negative charge, or at least a more negative charge than would the copper metal. If the two half cells are connected by a wire running from the zinc through a light bulb or some other electrical device to the copper strip, then the electrons will spontaneously flow from the zinc electrode, which is more negatively charged, to the copper electrode, which is more positively charged. As the electrons flow away from the zinc electrode, the zinc-zinc ion equilibrium shifts to the right based on Le Chatelier's principle and so oxidation occurs. As electrons flow to the copper electrode, the copper metal, copper ion equilibrium shifts to the left and reduction occurs. Flowing electrons constitute an electrical current that lights a light bulb. The idea that one electrode in a voltaic cell becomes more negatively charged relative to the other electrode due to differences in ionization tendencies is a key point in understanding how voltaic cells work. In electrochemical cells, we call the electrode where oxidation occurs the anode, and the electrode where reduction occurs is called the cathode. You might remember these from the mnemonic device anox in red cat. So we have reduction occurring at the cathode, and oxidation occurring at the anode. In a voltaic cell, the anode is the more negatively charged electrode, and so we label it with a negative sign. The cathode of a voltaic cell is more positively charged, and we label it with a positive sign. Electrons flow from the anode to the cathode, or from negative to positive, through the wires connecting the electrodes. As electrons flow out of the anode, positive ions form in the oxidation half cell, resulting in a buildup of positive charge in the solution. 
As electrons flow into the cathode, positive ions are reduced at the reduction half cell, resulting in a buildup of negative charge in the solution. If the movement of electrons from anode to cathode were the only flow of charge, the buildup of the opposite charges in the solution would stop electron flow almost immediately. We need a pathway by which counter ions can flow between the half cells without the solutions in the half cells totally mixing. One common way to do this is to add a salt bridge, which is an inverted tube that contains a strong electrolyte such as potassium nitrate and connects the two half cells. The salt bridge allows a flow of ions that neutralize the charge buildup in the two half cell solutions. In other words, the salt bridge completes the circuit, allowing electrical current to continue to flow. In our voltaic cell example, we talked about having a strip of zinc and a strip of copper acting as electrodes. Electrodes are simply metal surfaces that transfer electrons between the aqueous phase and the external circuit. Electrodes do not have to be directly involved in the electrochemical processes. Electrodes that are involved in the reaction are called active electrodes. Electrodes that are not involved in a reaction are called passive electrodes. Many passive electrodes will be some of the noble metals, such as platinum. In this voltaic cell, we see that we have platinum electrodes in both the cathode and the anode compartment. In the cathode compartment, we have a passive platinum electrode, which allows electrons to flow as it involves the reduction of iron 3 plus ions into iron 2 plus ions. In the anode compartment, we have hydrogen gas being bubbled into the anode solution and the hydrogen gas is oxidized to hydrogen ions through the gas bubbles interacting with a passive platinum electrode in the anode compartment. After watching this video, you should be able to identify the components of a voltaic cell. You should be able to distinguish between voltaic or galvanic electrochemical cells and catalytic electrochemical cells in terms of the spontaneity of the chemical reactions involved. You should also be able to distinguish between active electrodes and passive electrodes. Finally, you should be able to identify the flow of electrons in a voltaic cell.